All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our Wondrous Wednesdays uh, with High Energy. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to both of our speakers for joining us today. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first speaker today is Dr. Alexander Lutovinov. He's graduated from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, uh, is a professor and the deputy director for sciences of space at the Space Research Institute, uh, IKI at the Russian Academy of Sciences, and is the PI of the Mikhail Pavlinsky Art XC telescope on board SRG. Uh, his areas of research interest are high energy astrophysics, neutron stars, black holes, uh, white dwarfs, accretion, population studies of galactic sources, gravitational lensing, and the development of instruments for X ray astronomy. So please take it away. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to make a talk on the site on the seminar on the CFA. I remember many years ago I spent several very happy, productive months in the CFA during my uh, scientific visits. So it's a, it's a honor for me to make a, a presentation for this seminar. Can I make a demonstration? Sure. Yes. Is it OK? Um, can't, I can't see anything, actually. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, my. It's a road, it's my demonstration uh, stopped. Uh, I will try to, yeah, uh, I don't know why. Uh, stop. I will try again, probably something. Yes, I, I think should not be, should be work on properly now. Uh, there we go. Yeah, good. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, again. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I would like briefly present here some uh, highlights from the Mikhail Paulinsky Artex C telescopes, which uh, stated on, on board the uh, Spectrum X Gamma mission. And uh, I will uh, present briefly a describe of the instrument and uh, briefly describe uh, the first scientific results. Uh, okay, let's go further. And uh, first of all, I would like to say a few words about my uh, senior friend, uh, my colleague, and my teacher, Mikhail Pavlinsky. Uh, uh, he had BPI for the Arctic Sea Telescope and QI for the Spectrum X Gamma Observatory. And uh, he made a definitely, absolutely impressive and decisive contribution to the successful realization of the project. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in uh, July 2020, uh, uh, Mikhail Pavlinsky passed away, and in memory of our colleagues and friends, we decided to main the Arctic Sea Telescope after Mikhail Pavlinsky, the Mikhail Pavlinsky Arctic Sea Telescope. So this is uh, the uh, general view of the telescope, and uh, we the make key uh, parts of this instrument, like the detectors and the mirrors, and photo of Mikhail. So, in principle, Spectrum X Gamma had a very long story uh, from the end of the 19th, uh, it was a very big project with participation of dozens of countries and dozens of instruments. But I will not speak about uh, this in detail. I will speak only about the new life of this uh, project, which started in the uh, 2009, uh, at the Air Show Max 2009, then the Roscosmos and the, the German Space Agency DLR signed agreement on the Spectrum Rengen Gamma project and the, it's a new design. So uh, these uh, institutes uh, and uh, organizations who participate in this project from our side, from the Russian side, is Roscosmos, it's uh, our space agency. It's a definitely space research institute, is the main uh, scientific institute in this project. Lavochkin Association, who produced uh, the platform, the navigator platform for this project and make the assembling of the whole observatory. Uh, Russian Federal Nuclear Center in Sarov, who produced the mirror system for the qualification model of our instrument, and uh, Marshall Space Flight Center and NASA, uh, who produced the flight model for our telescope. And uh, other institutes that belong to the Germany and belong to the Erasit uh, collaboration. So uh, this uh, general view of uh, the uh, Spectrum X Gamma mission, you see here the sizes of, the, uh, of this uh, Observatory and uh, two instruments, 
it's uh, the slightly wider and low. These are the erosita uh, instruments which was produced in Germany, and uh, the uh, narrow and high it's uh, the Arctic Sea telescope uh, which was produced in uh, Russia. In principle, uh, uh, Spectrum X Gamma Observatory had the status of the flagship uh, uh, astrophysical mission of the Russian Federal Space Program uh, with participation of Germany. And in uh, this uh, photo in the right of my slide here, you see here it's my mouse. You see my mouse? It's a disappointing. Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, you see this a picture this was made in the February of uh, 2019, uh, just several days before the uh, transfer of the observatory to the Baikonur for the assembling to the rocket and to the uh, launch for the space. See here, it's both telescopes and the uh, solar panels, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's a main and principal scientific goals of the spectrum of gamma mission. Uh, due to the combination of larger field of view and effective area of both instruments, uh, obtained uh, uh, to probe uh, the volume of, of the uh, universe with the record volume and obtain new uh, fully uh, sensitive all sky survey up to 10,000 uh, minus 14. It's a soft energy band and uh, uh, obtained the most deepest, most uh, uh, exact uh, map of the universe in hard X rays with the Arctic Sea telescopes. And uh, as uh, they estimated in the preliminary stage, we should to see that uh, the uh, 10,000, uh, 100,000 of the cluster of galaxies, uh, millions of the supermassive black holes, uh, uh, several thousands of compact galactic objects, stars, et cetera, et cetera. So this will be the most deepest uh, map of the universe uh, at this moment. So, uh, the science pilot uh, of uh, our observatory includes, as I say, two instruments. It's uh, the Erosita and Arctic Sea. Uh, both instruments complement each other, being sensitive in the uh, soft uh, energy band, like Erosita, it's 0 0.3 uh, up to, in reality, up to the uh, 8 kV approximately, and the Arctic Sea, which work uh, from the 4 to till uh, 30 kV. And uh, both these instrument, as I say, complement each other and allow to make the uh, analysis of data and uh, uh, in the wide energy band. As I say, the key properties of uh, uh, both instruments, it's a so-called grasp, it's a uh, production of the large area for the large field of view. So uh, um, came into the uh, Arctic Sea, you see here, this is some schematical uh, uh, image of this telescope, uh, as uh, well as the Erosita ones, it also includes seven models. Uh, each model uh, consists of uh, the mirror system, which uh, here is located on the special optical bench plate and uh, the corresponding the detector plate, the seven detector units. Uh, the focal length is approximately 2.7 uh, meters. They also have the special strut tracker here, which also produced at the Space Research Institute. There's some special uh, thermal and electronic subsystems around uh, which, uh, uh, which give it the possibility to normally work with all the systems. So uh, I will uh, uh, show several uh, several photos, several pictures for this uh, for our telescope. You see here this general view of the telescope. As I said, it's a seven, seven models, which uh, uh, each of these models uh, uh, closed with the, some special mylar uh, thing uh, to avoid some uh, uh, contamination from the dust, et cetera, et cetera, from here. And uh, this is the optical bench plate with the already installed uh, seven uh, mirror systems. And uh, this is a detector plane, this corresponding seven detector uh, units. I will uh, say a few words about its construction and characteristics slightly later. And uh, in these two slides, two, two photos, so you see that it's a process of the assembling of the qualification model of uh, the uh, mirror systems at uh, the Federal, Russian Federal Nuclear Center, Sarov. Uh, uh, this is the qualification model, as I say. So uh, the parameter of the uh, X-ray mirror systems, 
as I said, it's a, this is a flight model. It's produced at uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, this idea to make the parallel production of uh, Miro systems in the Sarov and the, in the Marshall uh, was uh, to accelerate the production of the telescope as a, as a whole. As a, for example, they can make the every test, vibration test, uh, and in other ones with our qualification model. Uh, and the, during this time, the Marshall have a, a possibility to produce the flight model. So this uh, both uh, system, mirror systems was developed independently, which allow us to save, uh, I think, two or three years time uh, in production of the whole series. So, uh, uh, as I say, uh, uh, they had the seven mirror system, uh, number of nested mirror shells for each system is 28, this is Walter one, and they had the quite good angular on excess angular resolution, HPD, it's uh, approximately the th better than 35 uh, arc seconds. It depends from the model, but in general, it's uh, better than 35 arc seconds. So this is uh, another characteristics of the uh, mirror systems. Uh, the detectors uh, uh, for the detector units for the uh, Arctic Sea telescopes were fully developed at the key. Mm, uh, they developed, designed, uh, assembled, tested, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, these detectors. Only one thing which was produced uh, by Akrarat. Uh, Akrarat produced the uh, cadmium dyes for our instruments according to our technical requirements, according to our developments. And uh, finally, they had the very good detectors, uh, which uh, had the energy range from 4 to 120 kV. Uh, these detectors uh, had the, the double sides uh, st structure. They had the 84 strips on the top of the detector and 84 strips on the bottom of the detector, uh, which uh, around for the 90 degree. Uh, so they have a possibility to make the uh, quite good uh, angular, uh, quite good to the positioning of the uh, photons with the accuracy of the uh, 45 arc seconds. So that time of our instrument is uh, 0 0.77 milliseconds, but in principle, uh, the time and resolution is a much better is that they have the seven independent models for, for each model they have the 23 uh, microseconds so they can uh, work with the uh, quickly rotating neutron stars uh, to detect its pulsation and uh, make the some uh, uh, science with, uh, with the observations of sources i would like to know here this uh, the erasita had the uh, had the timing resolution only 50 millisecond which, uh, which is slightly worse than the arctic sea so and uh, uh, approximately two years ago, on the July uh, 13, uh, the Russian uh, launcher Pro Proton with the booster DM3 uh, successfully launched uh, the Spectrum of Gamma Observatory to the orbit and they started our travel to the our working orbit, which located at the uh, Lagrangian point L2. It's approximately 1.5 kilometers from the Earth. So the main uh, task, as I say, uh, this uh, obtaining of the most deep uh, uh, map uh, of the universe, therefore, during the first four years, uh, we will make uh, and the, uh, making at the moment uh, the all sky survey, uh, taking into account uh, the period of rotation of the instruments at uh, four hours and uh, four hours uh, uh, and uh, four hours. They had the six. Uh, six such uh, uh, rotations uh, during the day uh, and uh, uh, approximately uh, one degree uh, ring during the day they can observe on the sky. So full sky survey they completed in approximately six months and they plan to make the eight surveys in four years. So uh, it's allow us to make most deep uh, uh, map of the universe as I say and as, uh, uh, as well uh, they can make the uh, some study of the variability of the sky on the time scales uh, from hours to months, uh, to six months, to half years. So at the moment, they already made uh, uh, two uh, full uh, all sky surveys, and uh, in the June, they will, fin we will finish the third survey. And after this uh, program, after the program of the sky survey, they plan to work at least uh, 2.5 years uh, for the appointed observations of most interesting sources. So, as I say, on the 3rd of July, uh, they started uh, to the 
through our working orbit. And first time of Arctic Sea was obtained on the July 30. Uh, and you see here, this uh, the first picture. This was a uh, Centaurus X3. It's a very famous uh, uh, X-ray pulsars. It's, uh, it's first, as I remember correctly, first uh, X-ray pulsars and binary system we watch observed was found by Uhuru. So it was quite, uh, quite, quite important for us to observe the source as a first light for our instrument. And you see at the time of this first light, it was on the 3rd July, on the 60.30 minutes uh, of the UTC. So after the success of the first light, they started uh, Cal PV5 observations, which uh, 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 long it, uh, lasted uh, from the August 19 till uh, December 19. They observed several sources, uh, extended sources, uh, point sources, uh, make the, some trial, uh, trial uh, uh, all, uh, observations of, of the survey of the of sky. And uh, on the uh, 12th of December of the 19, they started uh, the first all sky survey, which was successfully uh, finished in the uh, last June. And uh, practically immediately they started uh, the second survey, which is finished in the uh, last December. And as I say, the next survey will uh, should be finished in the in this June, also in the middle of June. So uh, in the course of our surveys, they also make the several stops uh, for the orbit corrections. So and uh, in, uh, in these stops, uh, during these stops, uh, they have a possibility to make uh, several pointing observation uh, of uh, extended and point sources to make the some calibration, cross calibration with our instruments. So at this moment, they have the quite big uh, number of data. Most of them uh, belong to the All Sky Survey, but they also have the several dozens of pointing observations of uh, different sources. And now I will show the some preliminary results for as from the All Sky Survey as well as for these uh, pointing observations. So, as I say, uh, in the June. Uh, uh, in the June of the previous year, we finished our first Earth Sky Survey. And you see here the picture in the Uhuru style picture of the Earth Sky Survey. Uh, definitely they have the normal ones, but this Uhuru style is so quite nice, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, in principle, detection, detection threshold of this uh, map is uh, around 0 0.5 to 1 times to the 10 to the minus 11 ergs per second per square centimeters. And uh, probably in uh, some region, it's uh, even uh, better. Uh, I mean about uh, north and south poles. Then they had the ecliptic poles. I mean, uh, then they have uh, the, uh, practically everyday coverage. And at this moment, uh, the approximately 40% of our detected sources belong to the extragalactic ones. It's the AGNs of the uh, cluster of galaxies and uh, other the galactic ones. Uh, in this, if uh, they compare our results with uh, the preliminary results of Herazita, uh, they make the cross-checking of our maps. They found several dozen new sources, definitely. And some of them, uh, probably dozen, and probably quite little. It depends from the uh, threshold detections, uh, which now they still tune uh, the different energy bands. Uh, are not detected by Rosita. And uh, uh, example of such uh, object uh, you see here, it's, it's uh, the absorbed agents, and uh, they immediately organize the, uh, some multi -wave valence uh, and uh, observations and uh, uh, to, to, to study the sources and to establish their nature. And uh, they used the, some, several uh, telescopes located both in Russia and uh, in other countries, which have they some, uh, some agreements in the joint works uh, with the uh, Arctic Sea data. Yeah, I will not uh, stop here in the details. You see it's the number of telescopes here, which uh, allowed us to make the, already make the multivalence observations and establish nature of number, several dozens of sources. And I would like to show one of such uh, most interesting sources. Uh, it's uh, absorbed uh, AGN, which uh, 
found in the Arctic Sea catalog. You see here it's uh, this uh, the X-ray data. This uh, blue one point is a detection uh, of uh, this discovery with source with Arctic Sea. In the uh, red uh, uh, red arrows, it's the uh, upper limits uh, from the Erosita data. You see here that the Erosita did not detect the source due to high absorption, but the Arctic Sea nicely detect and the. the uh, in the error box, they found some uh, candidate, uh, both using the wise data, they found the uh, possible candidate for the optical counterpart of these X-ray sources, make the observations of, with uh, one of our instruments and found that this uh, safer tools absorb uh, uh, AGN, which located uh, at the uh, Z, the 0046 proxy. So now it's a results published in paper of our young scientist Igor Zaznobin, which uh, in which uh, the about dozen uh, of uh, new uh, Arctic sea sources uh, are investigated from the uh, point of the establishment of their nature. So as I say, in the end of last year, they finished uh, the second survey, and you see you see here it's a one year of survey with the Arctic Sea telescope. Uh, at uh, this map, uh, they detected at least, at least, it's a very conservative estimation with the quite higher uh, threshold, uh, 700 point sources. And additionally, they had the, about the 50 uh, extended sources here. And from which, uh, uh, and uh, they also made the analysis in the, the uh, very important energy range, seven to 20, 12 kV as a, in the, at this energies, our sensitivity became uh, much better than the Erosita and better than the other ones, instruments who work in this uh, uh, energy range. And uh, from these sources in the hard X-rays, they do not uh, approximately 100 sources, they not detected in the four to seven kV energy range that can be considered as a candidate for the absorbed source. According to our estimations, our knowledge of our sensitivity, upon completion of the four year skull survey, we expect to detect uh, around 5,000, probably 4,500, 4, 5,000 sources in the uh, full energy range. I would like to underscore here it said that uh, the range, the 412 uh, kV, are used for the, uh, this as a uh, based uh, energy range for the old sky survey, but as I say, they are uh, working normally till uh, 30 kV. So, and they already started uh, to study variability of sources and time scale with high year. Uh, definitely, this number of sources are uh, significantly low in comparison with Herazita. If you see the uh, paper of the uh, Peter Predel and other our colleagues and the estimations. But it's uh, uh, natural is uh, the number of photons in the hard X-rays significantly lower than in the, in the soft X-rays. And I would like to say that uh, this uh, map and this number of sources which are detected if Arctic Sea during one year, it's uh, in other instruments uh, which work in the hard X-rays like the MAXI or uh, SWIFT BAT or the Integral uh, uh, obtained during the dozens of years. So uh, they're very happy with our instrument with the sensitivity. And additionally, they have a much better angular resolution. So they also make the, some uh, observations of uh, uh, deep observations of the galactic center and the galactic plane. Uh, you see here it's uh, the galactic plane uh, around the galactic center. Uh, I would like to say that this uh, picture was obtained during the all sky survey. Therefore, the uh, exposure for each point here is uh, depend dependent from the uh, position uh, changed from the uh, uh, 30 to 60 seconds. So you should understand it's a very short exposure. But in addition to this, they had the deep observations of the galactic center during Cal PV phase. And here the observations was uh, much higher, it's approximately 10 times higher. And uh, the, in this uh, small, quite small region, Around the detected around uh, around the galactic center, we detected about uh, 150 sources from which uh, 30 it's new ones, and they also uh, see that uh, some uh, uh, extended structures around the, the galactic center position connected with some uh, molecular clouds, etc. Diffuse emission, it's uh, 
at this moment under the study, under the investigations, and they also see that it's nice pictures from the some neutron stars which located not far away from here. You see here it's a, um, two these uh, uh, SLX sources, as both the, the neutron stars, uh, it's a bursters, and they during these observations uh, observed uh, several uh, thermonuclear bars from this source. The uh, another region which also deeply uh, observed is the Arctic Sea and both the Erosita. It's uh, part of the galactic plane around L plus 20. It's a uh, depth here is around two times deeper than expected in our sky survey. It's also observations was during KLPV fires. They had the 30 detections here, the flux limit by 5.5 uh, uh, times to minus, uh, 10 to the minus 13. And uh, from uh, 30 sources, the uh, 13, uh, a new one. And now they are working on the investigation of the nature based on the observation with the optical uh, and infrared telescopes. And also they have uh, the deep observations of the normal arm and both for uh, this uh, uh, but both, both part of the galactic plane are not uh, at this moment now, uh, at this moment under investigations. And uh, I think they will publish the catalogs in the near few months. So, as I say, uh, the Arctic Sea Telescope is a very well instrument to observe the extended sources. And here you see some examples of, of such sources. Definitely the coma cluster was one of our primary targets here. And you see here, it's uh, two uh, different pictures obtained in the soft uh, X-rays, in the hard X-rays. Uh, it's a higher than the 10 kV in which both Chandra and XMM are, uh, uh, have the, uh, uh, above the 10 kV, uh, below which both uh, Chandra and XMM Newton are usually working, usually published the uh, 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 maps of this uh, cluster. They also observed uh, several uh, supernova remnants like this very famous source, which also observed with the has and the high, the very high energies, this Erix J7030. And we see this double structure of this source here. And they found some access for the Kupis, the energies uh, four to six kV now also under investigations. I would like to say that this approximately two degree size of this picture is a quite big one. So it's not so easy to obtain uh, such big uh, pictures with the uh, possibly obtained, but uh, you, it needs to spend more time for the Chandra or, for, or XMM Newton observations. So, so a few words about Arctic Sea performances, uh, the, uh, about spectral resolution uh, and energy scales. Uh, all our um, all our models have the special calibration system. Uh, each of them have the X-ray sources, which uh, include uh, uh, americium and uh, ferrum. And approximately every two months, we perform the, the uh, calibration observations. And you see on this picture, it's uh, the uh, both energy resolution and efficiency do not change with time. Only slightly changes the intensity of the uh, Ireland line. But it's uh, normal, it's uh, due to the time of uh, decay, it's approximately 2.4 years. So, and uh, this is spectrum one one of the high mass X-ray binaries. And you see here, it's in comparison with the ground, they able to detect bright source up to 30 kV. It's uh, fully agree with our estimations on the um, pre-launch pre stage. As I say, the Arctic Sea had a very nice timing capabilities uh, and uh, you see here, it's an example of five uh, millisecond pulsars uh, with the difference of their intensity about four orders of the magnitude, starting from the crop one and uh, finishing with uh, this uh, very faint, uh, very, very faint pulsar like 6017. And uh, they nicely detected pulsation from the 60 milliseconds up to thousands once for the long periodical systems. And uh, this is one of the examples of such uh, long periodical X-ray pulsars, which was uh, observed during CalPV phase again. Uh, uh, they especially observed the source in very, very low state. And for the first time, they found the pulsation in this state. You see here, it's a uh, red one. It's a uh, Z uh, statistics, uh, Z diagram for the Arctic Sea data. And this uh, uh, pulse profile here. And they obtained uh, the pre practically 
simultaneous with the gap of about 10 or 15 days uh, new star data, which confirmed our discoveries and more, more for the first time they, up, uh, they obtained the broadband spectrum in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, very low state and found they shown that uh, this spectrum can be described with two component model. One of them is a, is a computationization, second one probably connected with the cyclotron emission. It's confirmed that our previous discoveries for our sources and our new theory about the X-ray pulses. This is a, a magenta points. It's a spectral data from the uh, Arctic Sea. So, and uh, very important thing. Uh, I just wanna jump in for a second and say it's just about a minute or so to wrap up, please. Um, what would? Uh, we do need to wrap up and move on to our second speaker. So maybe just about a minute more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I need uh, two or three minutes. It's my last part of my presentation. I check oh. the timing. As right. I say a few words about uh, transients and finished. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's about a uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I will speak, uh, speak uh, quite quickly. Uh, yes, uh, this uh, diagram is daily observed part of the sky and sensitivity in many crops, and you see the position of Arctic Sea. So every day they observed about 1% of the sky daily, reaching the, uh, uh, reaching the sensitivity 10 to the minus 11, which correspond to this luminosity for different distances. They had a quite good localization accuracy, better than 20 arc seconds, and very fast response uh, about one, two hours after downlift. So this try to provide rapid alerts for the community. It's crucial for studying many uh, sources. And you see here, it's, uh, this our sensitivity, they can uh, observe practically whole galaxy for the, for the luminosities of two time, times 20, two times, uh, two times 10 to the 35 Earth per second. So during the first month, uh, the main catch, not so bright, not so frequent, but nevertheless, they obtained several a new high mass X ray binary candidates. They discovered new microcolizer in our uh, galaxy, uh, two uh, new symbiotic system, novel like system, outbursts from novel sources. And even if they detected the uh, GRB from the side shield of our instrument, or GRB afterglow and miss GRB. This is just example of uh, one of, for, for two such sources. Uh, this uh, you see here it's, uh, this uh, the results of uh, our measurements of, of uh, the flux from these sources uh, during the day on the daily scale during the each scans uh, each scans every four hours I say uh, uh, for these sources uh, the effective exposure is uh, just twenty uh, just fifteen seconds and this uh, as a follow up observation if uh, in the radio. Uh, band shown this uh, this uh, probably uh, missed GRBs now at this moment under the analysis and uh, this is a microquasar we discovered here and Maxi started to observe it only here several months later. And uh, very important was our discovery as a practically immediately it was observed with the new stars and uh, many observations and many science was done in this paper of a group from Caltech which uh, is, uh, these sources are. Uh, coincided with the some optical transient, and uh, at, the at this moment they have the some additional optical X-ray observations, and will be published in the paper of Ilya Miriminsky. It's a very very interesting peculiar source, as you see here. Practically no changes in the optic, but the changes about two uh, two orders of magnitude in X-rays. It's a practically uh, very difficult to explain. And uh, my final slides. They also can observe the GRBs, both, as I say, it's a mid GRBs, but both GRBs, this came from the side shield. As you see here, is a, uh, some artistic uh, uh, picture of such detection of GRBs. This moment, they had uh, several dozen such sources, and they now can work uh, in the triangulation with the EK and the interplanetary network system. And definitely, unfortunately, now the LIGO work does not work, but one of such uh, uh, such uh, uh, alerts was observed with the uh, Arctic Sea in the 2020. So, most inf uh, more information you can find in our paper describing Arctic Sea telescope at board spectrum is gamma, which now accepted for publication in astronomy, astrophysics, and appears in archive. And more papers are discussed will appeal soon in the special ANDSU early data release of Eurasita and Arctic Sea on the spectrum is gamma mission. Thank you for your attention. For your attention and thank, uh, sorry for the uh, short delay uh, with my presentation.
Thank you very much for a great talk. We are running a little behind, so we're just going to hold questions for everybody until the end. Uh, so without further ado, Peter, please uh, go ahead and introduce our next speaker. All right, our next speaker is uh, Julie Hlavacek Lorando, who earned her bachelor's and master's at the University of Montreal, her doctorate at the University of Cambridge with Andy Fabian on extreme AGN feedback in galaxy clusters. She was an Einstein fellow at Stanford, started a faculty position at University of Montreal in 2014, holds a Canada research chair in the observational astrophysics of black holes, especially in feedback. And uh, she has uh, uh, been awarded, uh, elected as a college member of the Royal Society of Canada, has an accelerator grant from NSERC, and is a strong advocate for diversity and co-founder of Parity Sciences. Uh, so without further ado, uh, please take it away, Julie. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just share the screen. <clears throat> okay, perfect. All right. So just to confirm, can you see the slide? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so uh, hi, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about a new project that my research group has been working on. Uh, which consists essentially of obtaining the first images of exoplanets and brown dwarfs orbiting X-ray binaries. Um, so I'll be highlighting a lot of the work done by my students here in, in the group. Just before I dive into this topic, I want to mention and highlight some of the other uh, work that my group specializes in. Uh, so in general, our quest is to understand uh, supermassive black holes and how they interact with their surrounding medium whether in galaxy clusters using X-ray observations or obtaining, obtaining some of the deepest radial images of clusters. Um, I just wanna point out uh, this project here. This is a more recent uh, adventure in, in research uh, where we've been essentially developing new machine learning tools to uh, better analyze um, Chandra observations. So if you're curious about this, I invite you to look at this paper here uh, and we have uh, many more that are uh, currently being um, worked on uh, in collaboration with uh, several CFA members, including Ralph Kraft and Akos Bogdan. Okay, so having said this, I'm going to dive in to the big question that we are trying to answer is essentially, can planets uh, form around extreme systems such as black holes? Okay, so this is a, a very big question um, uh, and this is our quest and has been for the last couple of years. And it turns out that we actually have the technology to answer this question. And so this is what I'll be presenting today. Um, and to start off, the first uh, question that we can ask ourselves is which systems sh should we start uh, looking at in particular to try and find planets uh, and brown doors? And it turns out that we do not yet have the technology to do this for supermassive black holes, but we do have it for stellar mass black holes. Um, so in general, stellar mass black holes, we now uh, categorize them in two main categories, those that have been found uh, with LIGO. Uh, unfortunately, these black holes here, these stellar mass black holes are uh, essentially too far and it's very difficult to pinpoint their location. Um, so it makes these targets not yet accessible. On the other hand, we do have a category of stellar mass black holes that we know very well that are nearby and that are in uh, big enough numbers that we can try to understand the statistical properties of, um, at least uh, uh, start to understand the statistical properties of uh, planets and brown dwarfs in these systems. And so uh, throughout this talk, what I'll be doing is I'll be focusing on X-ray binaries uh, and I'll be presenting you uh, these results here. So uh, the next question is once we've identified our targets, which are essentially X-ray binaries, uh, the question is, how do we actually find planets or in general substellar companions uh, in these systems? And the two main uh, techniques that have been used in the last 10 years or so for trying to find exoplanets in general uh, has been the uh, well-known transit method, which essentially uh, finds planets um, uh, when the planet goes in front of the star, it blocks out part of the light. And so you can find these shadows uh, and it's, it's often a signature of a planet present in the system. Um, it's also recently uh, been uh, proposed that you can find planets in X-ray binaries, particularly using this method uh, by these authors here. 
The second traditional method that uh, astrophysicists use is called the radial velocity method. So this is uh, in general, you have uh, here a binary system of a star and a planet. And what will happen is that the star will wobble around the center of mass because of the gravitational influence of the planet. And you can find these wobbles um, as a signature of the presence of a planet. Now, um, these methods are great. They found hundreds to thousands of planets the only problem is that these methods tend to be particularly good at finding planets nearby and uh, near the star, so very close to the star. Uh, they're more likely to find those planets. And the thing is, is that in X-ray binaries, one thing that we have to consider is that in X-ray binaries, uh, according to the literature, it turns out that it's uh, probably more likely uh, if there are planets present in X-ray binaries, these planets will tend to be in wide orbits uh, for several reasons, including that they're more likely to have interactions. You have a binary system. Uh, if there's a planet, there will be interactions, and this will tend to push out uh, those substellar companions to wider orbits. And the second thing to remember is that in X-ray binaries, we've often had a supernova um, that gave rise to the compact object in the binary system. And when you have these kinds of explosions, according to our theoretical understanding so far, uh, these explosions will tend to push out uh, any substellar companions to wider orbits. So we need a technique that's uh, better at identifying uh, planets and brown dwarfs in wide orbits. And the second thing to consider is that in X-ray binaries, and in particular class, a subclass known as high mass X-ray binaries, uh, which has a compact object and a massive uh, star as the donor star. Um, these high mass X-ray binaries um, are in general quite young because the uh, main uh, massive star here hasn't yet gone supernova. So that puts a constraint on the, age, on the age. And typically we're talking about millions of years, tens of millions of years. And systems that are this young may have planets and brown dwarfs that are still young and warm enough uh, to emit their own light. So they, these uh, young planets and brown dwarfs tend to be quite infrared bright. So we do, if you combine the fact that in X-ray binaries, according to theory, we may have, if there are planets and brown dwarfs, they may be at wider orbits and they may still be young enough to emit their own light. There exists a, a fantastic technique, uh, which is ideal for finding these kinds of planets and brown dwarfs. Um, which is called direct imaging. So direct imaging is essentially uh, what you do is you obtain a high contrast image of your source using a coronagraph. Uh, so very simply here, you have a, a very bright star, for example, the X-ray binary system. And what you do is you mask out the light. And when you do this uh, using a coronagraph, uh, by masking out the light, you, you can now detect the faint emission coming from the planets in the system. And so this is what we've used uh, to answer the question, can planets uh, exist in systems uh, such as black holes? Uh, and to do this, we use uh, the Keck telescope and the NERC-2 instrument, which is really one of the most state-of-the-art instruments for doing direct imaging now. So just briefly, I'm gonna mention the team here. Um, so our goal really is to get the first high contrast images of X-ray binaries. Uh, with the hope of identifying planets and substellar companions. I'll show that there are other interesting scientific questions that we can answer by obtaining these images. Um, and so this is in collaboration with Dimitri Mawet, who designed NIR2 on Keck. So he's been incredibly helpful uh, at helping us get time on Keck to be able to answer these questions. Uh, and I'm gonna highlight here two students, uh, Miriam, uh, who is actually here on online and Louis Simon Guité. So these are two students at the University of Montreal, uh, which have done a fantastic work uh, on these projects. And I'm gonna highlight mostly Miriam's uh, work throughout this talk. But there are many, many other people that are also part of this project. Okay, so let's dive in. So this is our goal, getting the first high contrast images of X-ray binaries. We specifically target all binaries, uh, X-ray binaries within about two to three kiloparsecs from us. Uh, because this essentially allows us to find substellar companions if present in the ranges of about a couple hundred to thousands of AU, uh, astronom um, astronomical units, um, from the binary system. So these are 
typical wide orbits that we're searching. Uh, we uh, primarily, we try or we're aiming to find exoplanets in one dwarfs, but the observations are also uh, sensitive to any stellar companions that are orbiting around the X-ray binary. And another uh, kind of um, a bonus feature of these kinds of observations is that they're, uh, since they're in the infrared, they're actually quite good at revealing any evidence of debris from the supernova or um, evidence that maybe we have a fallback disk that has formed post supernova. Uh, so lots of scientific questions that we can answer using these um, images and observations. Uh, so as I mentioned, what we've, the instrument we've used is near two on Keck. Um, and we had a, we have a total up until now of five nights of observations. So we've uh, looked at many, many X-ray binaries, oops, uh, many X-ray binaries. Uh, so from 2017 to about 2020. Uh, so these are all our, of our targets so far. Um, in case there are uh, people here that, are, that study X-ray binaries, you might find one of your favorite objects. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss any particular objects in more detail later on. But for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the preliminary results. So uh, this is uh, still preliminary. So we're still working on the analysis. But I'll highlight some of the main features that have come out of these observations. So uh, first and foremost, here is one of our targets. Uh, so this is Gamma Cassiopeia. It's a very well-known uh, binary system, um, very nearby as well, only about 0.2 kiloparsecs. Uh, I just want to emphasize here for uh, any, anybody who studies exoplanets, typically when we do direct imaging, we target uh, stellar systems that are very close to us. We're talking about parsec scales. Unfortunately, X-ray binaries are much rarer uh, than stars, and so we really have to start going out in terms of kiloparsecs uh, to study these systems. Uh, so this is a, one of the, the most famous targets here. It consists of a BE-type star. So a B star, uh, which uh, is known to have emission lines as well. Uh, so these are quite common uh, in B type stars. And uh, this system here, so you have a B type star plus a known companion orbiting nearby the B star. That's about one solar mass uh, in mass. It's still debated if this companion is a white dwarf, neutron star, or maybe even a solar type star. So it's still an X-ray binary candidate, um, but this is the kind of systems that we're looking at. Uh, thanks to the coronagraph here that masks out the light, we have this source that's been detected as well as this one. And I'm highlighting here the uh, masses of these systems here. So we're really sensitive to any kind of stellar companion uh, or substellar companion as well. In this case, we would have uh, a brown dwarf. Other um, well-known target is X uh, per, per C. Uh, so this is the image that we obtained for this system here. These are the kind of scales that we're probing uh, with these observations. So we're talking about a couple hundred AU in general. Again, you mask out the light and then you have these very faint uh, candidate companions uh, that we see here. And in this case, we have again, a BE type star plus a neutron star uh, um, or pulsar in the system here. Okay, so that's the kind of images that we obtain. Another very well-known source, this is my favorite uh, so, uh, so far, Cygnus X1, very historical, uh, important uh, object here. You have this beautiful image. You have a candidate here of 60 uh, Jupiter masses. Uh, so we're talking about brown dwarfs in this system, but um, Cygnus X1 is one of our furthest uh, systems that we've probed so far. So at a distance of about two kiloparsecs, so we're really, in this case, probing uh, 1,000 AU scales. Um, you can ask your, one of the questions that you can ask yourself is, if you have a brown dwarf at this kind of radii, is it still bound to the system? Uh, and yes, gravitationally, it would still be bound, uh, even at 3,000 AU. And so this is the kind of objects that we're looking at. I'm going to show you another result uh, of a very different system. Uh, so this is RxJ1744, um, so another X-ray binary. In this case, it's a gamma cast analog. So you have a BE type star, and it's still debated what the companion is, um, but it's argued that uh, it might be a white dwarf in this case. And so you have the X-ray binary at the center here. And what you see in this figure here are the L-band images obtained with NIRC2. Uh, very crowded field. 
So we have a lot of candidates uh, that we've identified in these images. Uh, and in this particular case, we decided to observe it with two bands, uh, so L and the KS band, to help us better identify planets in these systems. And I'll show you some of the results uh, for this. But uh, again, we're sensitive to hundreds of AU scales or thousands of AU, but this is the kind of objects that we're looking at. So uh, if I go in a bit more detail into this object here, uh, so RxJ 1744, it's a high mass X-ray binary with a BE star. Uh, it's uh, still debated what the companion is, but some papers argue that it's a white dwarf in this system. Uh, the age is approximately, uh, it's a couple dozen million years old, according to some population studies, uh, uh, which essentially, in this case here, looked at the position of the a binary system um, and looked at any nearby place star forming uh, cloud where it could have formed and how much time it would have taken to get to, to the specific distance it's at now. So it gives a rough constraint on the edge on the age, but it's it's still very uncertain, but we're talking about a couple dozen million years. In this case, we identify uh, 16 sources that have a signal to noise ratio that is greater than five. Uh, or 27 sources with a signal to noise ratio greater than three in the L band. And uh, L band is really what you want because uh, exoplanets tend to be redder and um, tend to light up in the L band compared to other bands. And so um, this is something that's uh, is quite important to remember. Uh, so these are the candidates. And so the question is, what, what are we looking at? Are we actually looking at uh, systems that are bound to the binary or are these simply background sources? So that's one of the big questions that you have to try to answer with direct imaging is how can you tell if the object that you're seeing that you detected, thanks to the coronagraph that blocked out most of the light of the, the main system, are these objects actually real companions that are bound to the X-ray binary or are they simply background objects? So. Uh, what can you do and how can you answer this question is there are several methods to do this. Uh, you can, of course, uh, determine what the flux is of the uh, companions that you've detected and uh, determine if these flux fluxes are consistent with a planet or a uh, stellar companion. Uh, so that is something that we can easily do with the observations. Um, another technique that's often used in the literature is to run galactic um, uh, stellar population models of the galaxy, and which essentially predict that for a given region in a sky, so let's say you're looking at a specific region, uh, based on the stellar population models of our galaxy, how many background sources you expect at this particular location. And what's interesting is that in all of the, in, in the vast majority of systems that we've looked at, we detect more uh, companions than what we predict uh, from the background, typically two uh, three times more companions. So this is indicating that maybe in general, we do have companions that are present uh, in X-ray binaries. Uh, of course, the main technique that is used in general for direct imaging when you wanna find planets is to do a proper motion anal analysis. So you observe a source, uh, let's say in 2017, and then you reobserve it uh, a couple years later to see if the companion has moved uh, as if it were bound to the system. Uh, and we can actually do this with gamma cast. We now have observations in 2017 and 2020, which allows us to do this for this object. Uh, these results are, st we're still working on them. So I'm not gonna present them today. They're too preliminary, uh, but this is something that we will do. Uh, we can do it for all the other X-ray binaries we've observed, but considering that these sources are very far, we have to rate, several more years again uh, uh, before we can do this for every single X-ray binary. Probably in 2025, we'll be able to do this uh, and um, do this method for the X-ray binaries. In the meantime, there's another technique uh, which gives a pretty robust constraint on whether the companions we find are bound to the X-ray binary or just background sources. And this is called a color magnitude diagram. So uh, we need two bands, and this is what we have for RxJ 1744. So I'll show you these results here. 
Uh, so this is a typical color magnitude diagram for uh, planets and round doors. So you have the absolute magnitude in L band, uh, and then you have a KS minus L band here. Uh, these are different models that predict the evolution of planets. Uh, so typically you have candidate giant exoplanets, which should be located in this regime, regime here. Uh, and you can start going up to brown doors and even uh, stellar companions. Um, so that are about one solar mass or approximately one solar mass uh, in mass here. So this is where you expect these different systems to fall. It depends on the age of the system. So uh, you can play with the age uh, depending on how old the system is. It's very tricky to get a uh, robust constraint on the age of X-ray binaries. Uh, but this is what you, you get in depending on the, the age that you use. And in the case of RxJ1744, if I show you all of the candidates that we found, so these, all, all the, the circles here are companions that have been identified in the high contrast images of RxJ1744. Uh, I'm showing here all the sources that have a signal to noise ratio greater than five in L band. So this is where you expect planets to lie. And so, so far for this system, we've been able to identify some candidates uh, that are uh, stellar and um, uh, at the limit of uh, brown dwarfs, um, although brown dwarfs stop about this limit here. But it gives you an idea of what we can do with these systems. And this is, again, uh, a source that's quite far from us. So uh, this is what we obtain for now. So those are some of the preliminary results. Um, and I just want to finish here since my time is up. Uh, so the, the big question that we're trying to answer here is, you know, can, can planets actually form in systems that contain black holes? Uh, we've targeted X-ray binaries, uh, all of the nearby X-ray binaries within about two to three kiloparsecs. And we're now just beginning to analyze all the information that we have from these images and all the promising uh, planets and brown, brown dwarfs that we find in X-ray binaries. So we're really just at the tip of the iceberg of what we can do with these images. And I'll take questions now. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for a great talk. Let's thank both of our speakers. Uh, due to the uh, time constraints, we will take questions for either of our speakers now, if you want to raise your hand in the participants window, or if you want to uh, type it out in the chat, we can read it for you. And I see a question from Mila. Yes, thank you. Um, those were actually. Sorry that I, um, I accidentally unmuted. I accidentally muted you trying to lower your hand. <laughs> That's okay. Um, those were both amazing talks. Thank you. Um, I had a question for Alexander. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that there uh, that you found. Um, galaxy cluster sources um, with RxC that don't show up in Eero Zeta. And um, I found that a little bit confusing uh, or surprising because um, with AGN, you expect a lot of hard X-ray emission. So it would make sense if RxC sees a lot more than Eero Zeta. But galaxy clusters, you expect the emission to be peaking around a few KV. No, 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 Mila, I'm sorry. Uh, the detected uh, only GNs, not galaxy clusters. All galaxy clusters which I uh -huh. detected, they also see in the Erosita and the, the soft ones, definitely. So no galaxy clusters. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. Thank you. Um, and also, um, why, um, why is it advantageous to place Erosita uh, so far away at L2 as opposed to a closer orbit around the Earth? Uh, repeat, please, question. I don't... So, um, so SRG, it yes. is the orbit around L2, right? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's really far away and uh, hard to do. Yeah, a, I understand. Yeah, yeah, do okay, okay. What I'd is say... the advantage of that versus having it closer to the Earth? Yeah, it's a main advantage. Uh, they have the very stable uh, background conditions. Very, very stable. And uh, they have they make the observations, making a survey without any interruptions during the problem with South African anomaly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, probably other things. So 
uh, if uh, they compare, for example, with the high elliptic orbit, they have the very big uh, uh, background for such uh, orbits. If they have the near Earth orbit, they have the some uh, prob not problems, but it's uh, issues with the uh, South African anomaly, et cetera, et cetera. But at the L2, they have the very nice uh, conditions and they have a the very, very stable background. It's a variation at uh, the scale about percent. Thank you. All right, any more questions for either speaker? Uh, we have a comment from Dan Schwartz. L2, also it's a stable thermal orbit. Yeah. So there's yeah. no earth occultation, which makes it very high uh, efficiency for observing. Don't be shy. Okay, can I ask a question to Julie? Go ahead. Um, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, your idea is so interesting. Um, and, um, oh my gosh, I forgot my question. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes here it is so um so um i'm not an expert in star formation um and so i'm curious you know when we talk about galaxies and galaxy clusters and things like that uh you you expect things to be clustered and um so I, i'm i'm curious about don't we expect a similar sort of clustering in the way that individual stars form. So if you have an X-ray binary, does, it, does that maybe suggest that you are already in a region of high stellar density and so you're more likely to find extra companions that are stellar? Absolutely. Um, so there have been several papers that have looked at um, multiplicity. So uh, the more like in binary systems, you're more likely to have stellar companions and uh, substellar companions. Um, I don't think observationally it's been seen so far. I think it's still theoretical, but uh, this is one of the other reasons why we targeted X-ray binaries is there should be more uh, multi multiplicity in this system. Um, and do you think the reason it hasn't been observed, so uh, is it because of the, the contrast issue um, or are there, yeah. are there other challenges? Yeah, so we were surprised when we started this project in 2017, we were surprised that um, no high contrast instrument had looked at a binary system. Um, so it, it, it was never seen, like nobody ever took an image like this before. Um, I, I think it's two factors. One, um, a lot of nearby X-ray binaries are very, very bright. Uh, so the, the contrast, like you'll never get an earth sized planet with current instruments um, because the contrast would be too high. Um, and the second thing is that X-ray binaries are rarer than stars. And so you do have to go out to further distances. And so far, most of the studies that have focused on direct imaging um, have focused on nearby stars. So parsecs kind of scale. Um, so we're really looking way further out. So I think those are the two main reasons that contributed to this. And do you think, uh, is there a possibility of, if you're finding tertiary companions that are stars, I know so far you only mentioned brown dwarfs, but um, can you also detect stars in this way? And if so, can you potentially find precursors to like tidal disruption events? Yeah, so this is super interesting. So these ob observations will be sensitive to stellar companions. So you have the binary, uh, which has a star and then the compact object, and then you'll be sensitive to a wide orbit stellar companion. And what's interesting is that um, even if you have like one of these stellar companions, the fact that it's in a wide orbit won't affect the, the, the binary system that much. So it's, it's very hard to detect the presence of these companions using velocities, for example, um, but direct imaging is perfect for this. And so we are working uh, on one particular source in which we've actually found one of these companions, which I won't mention for now since it's pre preliminary. Thank you.
Great. Well, if there aren't any other questions, let's thank both of our speakers again for a couple of really excellent talks and thank all of you for attending. We'll see you again next week.